As we've been continuing in our journey through the New Testament epistle of 1 Peter, we began a series last week that overall is called Embracing Submission. And in the context of the first part of that series, I maintained that for Peter, the posture of submission is the fundamental posture of God's people in this world. This week, as we continue in Peter's letter to the Christians of Asia Minor, we'll endeavor to hear Peter's exhortations regarding the purpose, or maybe even better, the purposes of submission. Now, we've already discussed the purpose of submission to a degree. Peter has already suggested that the purpose of submission is witness, and I indicated in our last discussion that the purpose of submission is for the transformation of the world and worldly ways of living. But in these next verses of Peter's letter, the purpose of submission takes a much clearer and more practical shape. If you have access to a Bible this morning, I invite you to turn with me to the New Testament epistle of 1 Peter. Today we're in chapter 2. Last week we discussed verses 11 through 17, so today we'll pick up reading in verse 18. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that, if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. What is the purpose or the purposes of submission? This passage is difficult for many reasons, and one nearly insurmountable difficulty in the verses I've just read is that it addresses two societal issues that were commonplace in the time of the New Testament, but today are viewed both secularly and in many Christian traditions as social evils. Slavery and the subordination of women to their husbands. In this passage, Peter has utilized a common societal model in the Roman Empire of his day, which historians often call the Roman Household Code. Many of the elements of that code are present in Peter's reflection upon it. However, what is most inter interesting for us are not the ways in which Peter's teaching mirrored that of the Greco-Roman society in which he lived, but rather the alterations to that code that Peter's understanding of the gospel of Jesus has required him to make. And it's these adjustments of Peter that will help us to get at the heart of Peter's admonition. Now, we should probably recognize that slavery in the Roman Empire was of a different sort for the most part, than the form of slavery practiced in Europe and the Americas in the recent past. But even with that said, both Christian communities and secular Western societies today believe that slavery in all of its forms is an evil and one that should be opposed and overcome by the nations and cultures of the earth. And given this conviction, it would be helpful to discover with certainty what Peter's opinion of slavery as an institution might have been. Sadly, however, we can't know that for certain. In this passage, Peter has neither endorsed nor has he condemned the practice of slavery. He's just assumed it to be a given. The subordination of women to husbands is another issue it would be nice to have had Peter address directly. In an ideal world, one in which the gospel of Jesus had thoroughly permeated all hearts and minds, all homes and governments, and one in which the ethics of the kingdom of God as embodied in Jesus were embraced and embodied by all citizens, what would the relationship between husbands and wives or males and females look like? Sadly again, Peter has not told us, 
I think he may have implied something when he stated earlier in his letter that all God's people are priests, but he said nothing overtly about what should be with respect either to slavery or to the relationship of husbands and wives in a household. Rather, Peter was helping his readers to live as Christians in the midst of the cultures and contexts in which they actually lived. Peter's instructions are not descriptions of an idealized society that will one day exist. Peter's words were written to people living in the world of the Roman Empire in the first century AD, and that was a society that was, in many ways, built upon the societal relationships between slaves and masters and husbands and wives. Peter was instructing people who lived in a society which condoned and even commanded such behavior as to how to live in a posture of submission in that context. When we read texts like this today, it's hard for us to resist asking the question, how should the world be? So perhaps we find it frustrating that Peter didn't ask or respond to that question. Peter's concern was what it meant to live as a follower of Jesus in the world as it presently was. Consequently, Peter asked a different question. And for those living in fallen contexts today, perhaps a much more practical one. Rather than asking what should the world look like, Peter asked, why are you refusing to submit? And then he followed up his question with a more pointed one. Is that attitude consistent with the example set for us by Jesus? Now, it's not unimportant for us to know what behaviors God values and what ethics God would ideally wish societies and families and individuals to embody. Those are important inquiries and there are passages in the Bible, at least to my reading, that may speak to those concerns. However, what I believe Peter was trying to avoid was the impression that in order to be a Christian, a person has to live in a thoroughly Christian context. In other words, by focusing too intently on the world as it should be, we can be left believing that we cannot live as Christians in the world as it is. Transforming the world is a noble goal, but living as Christians in the world, no matter the context, is far more important in this time between the first and second comings of Jesus. Peter's words insist that Christians must live as Christians no matter the ethics, values, decisions, or laws of the societies in which we live. And by exhorting Christians to live in submission to every authority instituted among humans in verse 13, Peter has suggested that submission will look different in every context in which we attempt to submit. The government and the society in which we live will set the terms of submission, and as Christians we must submit to them for the Lord's sake, unless, of course, submission to them would force us to forsake our submission to God. And so, in the Roman Empire of Peter's day, slaves were expected to submit to their masters, and throughout most of the history of the Near East, up to and including the Roman Empire of Peter's day, wives were expected to submit to their husbands as the head of household. Peter did not weigh in on the ethics of those requirements, nor did he advocate for Christians to rebel against them. For Peter, the posture of Christianity is submission, and so Christians embrace submission in whatever form their respective governments and societies require it. Hear Peter's words again. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit, if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, 
when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right, and do not give way to fear. Living submissively in the midst of injustice is no simple or apparently wise decision. Perhaps we've all heard the old adage, all it takes for evil to prosper is for good people to do nothing. And resistance to authority is certainly not categorically condemned throughout the scriptures. But it is important to note that Peter has made it clear that such resistance to authority, when it has been endorsed by God, is resistance to authorities which are forcing or compelling God's people to rebel against him or his requirements. Along these lines, the scriptures are replete with examples of followers of God having to refuse to obey governing authorities because to do so would be to disobey God himself. The story of Daniel's refusal to stop praying to God, and the story of Peter and John's instruction to stop preaching in Jesus' name by the Jewish authorities both come to mind as examples of this sort of resistance. However, Submission to authorities does not always force a person to disobey God. And for Peter, rather than attempting to change unjust societal structures through rebellion or violence, he has reminded us to follow the model of Jesus, who through the cross transformed a wicked world by means of his willingness to suffer and die at the hands of ungodly people. Because the kingdom of God allows no compromise with its cardinal virtue of submissiveness, those who are members of the kingdom cannot embody a rebellious spirit for any reason. So the posture of Christians and the posture of the church, as the posture of Jesus on the cross gives shape to us, is a posture of submission. But what is the purpose or the purposes of submission then? Look again at verse 19. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Wives in the same way submit to your own husbands, so that, if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. The purposes of submission in these verses are primarily two, personal transformation and the sharing of the gospel. Peter encouraged slaves to submit even to ungodly and harsh masters, not because beatings are helpful or good, nor because slavery is a good or moral social invention. Instead, Peter has insisted that those who submit to unjust treatment because of their submission to the example of Jesus for that reason, they will be commended before God and transformed by their suffering into the likeness of Jesus. In other words, for Peter, if we wish to be transformed into the image of God, then we must be willing to suffer disrespect, indignity, and injustice. By embracing submission in these sorts of circumstances, Peter promises we will be transformed into the likeness of Christ. And Peter encouraged wives to submit to their husbands, not because women were inherently inferior, nor because men were designed to rule, nor because God necessarily approved of the Roman Empire's understanding of male-female relationships in the home. Instead, Peter encouraged wives to submit to their husbands because it was considered right in that culture, and through that behavior their discipleship to Jesus might be demonstrated publicly. Evil is overcome. People are transformed, and the gospel of Jesus is spread for Peter, not by revolution or rebelliousness or disrespect or disdain or vindictiveness, but by submission. Submission, in its many forms, 
respectfulness, honor, civility, is the weapon of war of the kingdom of God. These are the purposes of submission. And these are the avenues through which followers of Jesus are transformed into the likeness of Jesus. These are the avenues through which unbelieving neighbors are confronted with the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus. And these are the avenues through which godless societies are exposed for their godlessness. The Apostle Paul has written in the book of Ephesians that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. How could we possibly defeat an enemy or change the world if we are subjugated or even killed? It's a sound question. But we must remember that our battle is not against flesh and blood. The mission of God's priests in the world is not to defeat enemies or to overcome nations or to set up a kingdom of God on earth. Our battle is against systemic forces of evil that rule this world. And the only way, according to the gospel, to defeat those forces of evil is to refuse to cooperate with them. To war against the evil powers, both around us and within us, we must submit. Submission declaws our evil impulses, and it reorients us in the world. To war against the dominance of wickedness, we must live differently. And in this way, the world may see a different way to live, and perhaps they may even come to see the poverty and corruption of their own values. We are challenged by Peter's last statement in chapter 3, verse 6, when he says, You are her daughters if you do what is right, and do not give way to fear. In the end, submission is a matter of trust. Trust in God and in God's way. Even though he asked for another way on the night he was betrayed, Jesus was willing to submit himself to God's way at great personal cost. We too must come to trust God's way as Jesus did. Whatever we may tell ourselves, Revolution and rebelliousness are not born out of righteousness or justice or zeal for God. These things are born out of fear, and it's a type of fear we must not give in to. We must pattern our lives and our families and our churches after the pattern of Jesus. We must embrace submission, and we must trust God that through our posture of submission, God's purpose of transformation and faithful witness will be fulfilled. May it be so.